Continuing Pericles from Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Klopp. Whence it is that neither do such things really profit or advantage the beholders, upon the sight of which no zeal arises for the imitation of them, nor any impulse or inclination which may prompt any desire or endeavor of doing the like, but virtue by the bare statement of its actions can so affect men's minds as to create at once both admiration of the things done and desire to imitate the doers of them the goods of fortune we would possess and would enjoy those of virtue we long to practice and exercise we are content to receive the former from others the latter we wish to experience from us moral good is a practical stimulus it is no sooner seen than it inspires an impulse to practice and influences the mind and character not by a mere imitation which we look at, but by the statement of the fact creates a moral purpose which we form. And nowadays people look more to the artists that talk about things or express some idea than those that actually live the ideas. And so we have thought fit to spend our time and pains in writing of the lives of famous persons and have composed this tenth book upon that subject containing the life of Pericles and that of Fabius Maximus, who carried on the war against Hannibal. Men alike, as in their other virtues and good parts, so especially in their mind and upright temper and demeanor, and in that capacity to bear the cross-grained humors of their fellow citizens and colleagues in office, which made them both most useful and serviceable to the interests of their countries. Whether we take a right aim at our intended purpose, it is left to the reader to judge by what he shall find here. Pericles was of the tribe Acamatis, and the township Colargus of the noblest birth, both on his father's and mother's side. Xanthippus, his father, who defeated the king of, Persians, uh, of Persia's generals in the battle of Machael, took to wife. Agarist, the grandchild of Cleisthenes, who drove out the sons of Pisistratus and nobly put an end to their tr tyrannical usurpation. And, moreover, made a body of laws and settled a mode of government at admirably tempered and suited for the harmony and safety of the people. His mother, being near her time, fancied in a dream that she was brought to a bed of a lion, and a few days after was delivered a Pericles, in other respects perfectly formed. Only his head was somewhat longish and out of proportion, for which reason almost all the images and statues that were made of him have the head covered with a helmet, the workman apparently being willing not to expose him. The poets of Athens called him Skinocephalus, or squillhead, from Skinos, a squill, or sea onion. One of the comic poets, Cratinus, in the Chirons, tell us that old Cronos once took queen, sedition to wife, which too brought to life that tyrant far famed, whom the gods the supreme skill compeller have named, and in the Nemesis addresses him, Come, Jove, thou head of gods, and a second Tetocletus says, now in the embarrassment with political difficulties, he sits in the city, fainting underneath the load of his own head, 
and now abroad from his huge gallery of a pate sends forth trouble to the state. And a third, he polis in the comedy called the Demi, in a series of questions about each of the demagogues whom he makes in the play to come up from hell upon Pericles, being named last, exclaims, and here by way of summary now we've done, behold in brief the heads of all in one. The master that taught him music, most authors are agreed, was Damon, whose name they say ought to be pronounced with the first syllable short, through Aristotle, uh, though Aristotle tells us that he was thoroughly practiced in all accomplishments of this kind by Papaclides, Damon, it is not unlikely, being a sophist at a policy, sheltered himself under the profession of music to conceal from people in general his skill in other things, and under this pretense attended Pericles, the young athlete of, politi uh, of politics, so as to say, as his training master in these exercises. Damon's lyre, however, did not prove altogether a successful blind. He was banished the country by ostracism for ten years as a dangerous intermeddler and a favorer of arbitrary power, and by this means gave the stage occasion to play upon him, as for instance Plato, the comic poet, introduces a character who questions him. Tell me, if you please, since you were the Chiron who taught Pericles. Pericles also was a hearer of Zeno, the Eleatic, who treated of natural philosophy in the same manner as Parmenides did, but had also perfected himself in an art of his own for refuting and silencing opponents in argument, as Timon of Phlias describes it. Also, the two edged tongue of mighty Zeno, who say what one would, could argue it untrue. But he that saw most of Pericles, and furnished him most especially with the weight and grandeur of sense, superior to all arts of popularity, and in general gave him his elevation and sublimity of purpose and of character, was Anaxagoras of Clasamena, whom the men of those times called by the name of Nous, that is, mind or intelligence, whether in admiration of the great and extraordinary gift he had displayed for the science of nature, or because he was the first of the philosophers who did not refer to the first ordering of the world to fortune or chance, nor to necessity or compulsion, but to a pure, unadulterated intelligence, which in all other existing mixed and compound things acts as a principle of discrimination and of combination of like with like. For this man, Pericles, entertained an extraordinary esteem and admiration, and filling himself with this lofty and, as they call it, up-in-the-air sort of thought, derived hence, not merely, as was natural, elevation of purpose and dignity of language, raised far above the based and dishonest buffooneries of mob eloquence, but besides this, a composure of countenance and a serenity and calmness in all his movements, which no occurrence whilst he was speaking could disturb, a sustained and even tone of voice, and various other advantages of a similar kind, which produced the greatest effect on his hearers. Once, after being reviled and ill-spoken, of all day long, in his own hearing by some vile and abandoned fellow in the open marketplace, where he was engaged in the dispatch of some urgent affair, 
continued his business in perfect silence, and in the evening returned home. Composedly, the man, still dodging him at the heels and pelting him all the way with abuse and foul language and stepping into his house, it being by the, this time dark, he ordered one of his servants to take a light and to go along with the man and see him safe home. Eon, it is true, the Doranic poet says that Pericles's manner in company was somewhat over-assuming and pompous, and that his high bearing there entered a good deal of slightingness and scorn of others. He reserves his commendation for Kimon's ease and pliancy and natural grace in society. Eon, however, who must needs make virtue like a show of tragedies, includes some comic scenes we shall not altogether rely upon. Zeno used to bid those who called Pericles's gravity the aff affectation of a, a charlatan to go and affect the like themselves, inasmuch as this mere counterfeiting might in time insensibly instill into them a real love and knowledge of those noble qualities. Well, we often see with soothsayers and other false spiritual leaders that they uh, may really only deceive those that are, you know, likewise of the misled sort. <clears throat> Nor were these the only advantages which Pericles derived from Anaxagoras' acquaintance. He seems also to have become, by his instruction, superior to that superstition with which an ignorant wonder at appearances, for example, in the heavens, possesses the minds of people unacquainted with their causes, eager for the supernatural, and excitable through an experience which the knowledge of natural causes removes, replacing wild and timid superstition by the good hope and assurance of an intelligent piety. There is a story that once Pericles had brought to him from a country farm of his a ram's head with one horn and that lampon, the diviner, upon seeing the horn grow strong and solid out of the midst of the forehead, gave it as his judgment that there being at that time two potent factions, parties, or interests in the city, the one of Thucydides and the other of Pericles, the government would come about that one of them, in whose ground or estate this token or indication of fate had shown itself, but that Anaxagoras, cleaving the skull in center, showed to the bystanders that the brain had not filled up its natural place, but being oblong like an egg, had collected from all parts of the vessel, which contained it in a point at that place, from whence the root of the horn took its rise, and that for that time Anaxagoras was much admired for his explanation by those that were present, and Lampon no less, a little while after, when the Cadidas was overpowered, and the whole affairs of the state and government came into the hands of Pericles. And yet, in my opinion, it is no absurdity to say that they were both in the right, both natural philosopher and diviner, one justly detecting the cause of this event by which it was produced, the other the end for which it was designed, for it was the business of the one to find out and give an account of what it was made, and in what manner, and by what means it grew as it did, and of the other to foretell to what end and purpose it was so made, and what it might mean or portend. portend. Those who say that to find out the cause of a prodigy is to affect to destroy its supposed significance as such. 
do not take notice that, at the same time, together with divine prodigies, they also do away with signs and signals of human art and concert, as, for instance, the clashing of quoits, fire beacons, and the shadows of sundials, every one of which has its cause, and by that cause and contrivance is a sign of something else. But these are subjects, perhaps, that would better befit another place. Pericles, well yet, but a young man, stood in considerable apprehension of the people. I was he, as he was thought in face and figure, to be very like the tyrant Pisistratus, and those of great age remarked upon the sweetness of his voice, and his volubility and rapidity in speaking, and were struck with amazement at the resemblance, reflecting, too, that he had a considerable estate, and was descended of a noble family, and had friends of great influence. He was fearful all this might bring him to be banished as a dangerous person, and for this reason meddled not at all with state affairs, but in military service showed himself of a brave and intrepid nature. But when Arist Aristides was now dead, Themistocles driven out, and Cimon was, for the most part, kept abroad by the expeditions he made in parts out of Greece, Pericles, seeing things in this posture, now advanced and took his side, not with the rich and few, but with the many and poor, contrary to his natural bent, which was far from democratical, but most likely fearing he might fall under suspicion of aiming at arbitrary power, and seeing Cimon on the side of the aristocracy, and much beloved by the better and more distinguished people, he joined the party of the people, with a view at once both to secure himself and to procure means against Cimon. He immediately entered also on, a, on quite a new course of life and a management of his time, for he was never seen to walk in any street but that which led to the marketplace and council hall, and he avoided invitations of friends to supper and all friendly visiting and intercourse whatever, in all the time he had to do with the public, which was not a little, he was never known to have gone to any of his friends to a supper, except that once, when his near kinsman, Europe Ptolemus, married, he remained present till the ceremony of the drink offering, and then immediately rose from the table and went his way, for these friendly meetings are very quick to defeat any assumed superiority, and in intimate familiarity an exterior of gravity is hard to maintain. Real excellence, indeed, is most recognized when most openly looked into, and in really good men, nothing which meets the eyes of external observers so truly deserves their admiration, as their daily common life does that of their nearer friends. Pericles, however, to avoid any feelings of commonness or any sadity on the part of the people, presented himself at intervals only, not speaking to every business, nor at all times coming into the assembly. But as Kriterlaus says, reserving himself, like the Salaminian galley, for great occasions, while matters of lesser importance were dispatched by friends or other speakers under his direction, and of this number we are told, Ephialtes made one who broke the power of the council of Areopagus, giving the people, according to Plato's expression, so copious and so strong a draught of liberty that, growing wild and unruly, like an unmanageable horse, it, as the comic poets say, got beyond in keeping in, champing at Euboea and among the islands, leaping in, <coughs> got beyond all keeping in, champing at Euboea and among the islands, leaping in. 
the style of speaking most constant to his form of life, and the dignity of his views he found, so to say, in the tones of that instrument with which Anaxagoras had furnished him. Of his teaching he continually availed himself, and deepened the colors of rhetoric with the dye of natural science, for having in addition to his great natural genius attained by the study of nature, to use the words of the divine Plato, this height of intelligence, and this universal consummating power, and drawing hence whatever may be of advantage to him in the art of speaking, he showed himself far superior to all others. And we see this way of speaking, they speak of somebody as a divine if they're notably superior, um, whether by, you know, training or whatever. Um, upon which account, they say, he had his nickname given him, though some are of opinion that he was named the Olympian from the public buildings with which he adorned the city, and others, again, from his great power in public affairs, whether of war or peace, nothing is it unlikely that the confluence of many attributes may have conferred it on him. However, the comedies represented at the time, which both in good earnest and in merriment let fly many hard words at him, plainly show that he got that appellation especially from his speaking. They speak of his thundering and lightning when he harangued the people, and of his wielding a dreadful thunderbolt in his tongue. A saying also of Pocadides, the son of Milesius, stands on record spoken by him by way of pleasantry upon Pericles' dexterity. Pocadides was one of the noble and distinguished citizens, and had been his greatest opponent. And when Archidamus, the king of the Lacedaemonians, axed him whether he or Pericles were the better wrestler, he made this answer. When I, said he, have thrown him and given him a bare fall, by persisting that he had no fall, he gets the better of me, and makes the bystanders, in spite of their own eyes, believe him. The truth, however, is that Pericles himself was very careful what and how he was to speak, insomuch that, whenever he went up to the hustings, he prayed the entities that no one word might unawares slip from him, unsuitable to the matter and the occasion. He has left nothing in writing behind him, except some decrees, and there are but very few of his sayings recorded. One, for example, is that he said, Agina must, like a gathering in a man's eye, be removed from Hiraas. And another, that he said, he saw already war moving on its way towards them out of Peloponnesus. Again, when on a time, Sophocles, who was his fellow commissioner in the generalship, was going on board with him, and praised the beauty of a youth they met with in the way to the ship. Sophocles, said he, a general ought not only to have clean hands, but also clean eyes. And Stesimbrothus tells us in his encomium on those who fell in battle at Samos, he said, they were become immortal, as entities were, for, said he, we do not see them themselves, but only by the honors we pay them, and by the benefits they do us, attribute to them immortality, and the like attributes belong also to those that die in the service of their country, since Thucydides describes the rule of Pericles as an 
aristocratical government that went by the name of a democracy. So, like America, right? Uh, but was indeed the supremacy of a single great man. The same ruling country, uh, same ruling families pretty much rule, you know, either side of the Atlantic, right? Um, while many others say, on the contrary, that by him the common people were first encouraged and led on to such evils as appropriations of, the, of subject territory, allowances for attending theaters, payments for performing public duties, and by these bad habits were, under the influence of his public measures, changed from a sober, thrifty people that maintained themselves by their own labors to lovers of expense, intemperance, and license. Let us examine the cause of this change by the actual matters of fact. At the first, as has been said, when he set himself against Kimon's great authority, he did caress the people, finding himself come short of his competitor in wealth and money, by which advantages the other was, enabled to take care of the poor, inviting every day some one or other of the citizens that was in want to supper, and bestowing clothes on the aged people, and breaking down the hedges and enclosures of his grounds, that all that would might freely gather what fruit they pleased. Pericles, thus outdone in popular arts by the advice of one Demonides of Oea, as Aristotle states, turned to the distribution of the public monies, and in a short time, having brought the people over, what with monies allowed for shows and for services uh, for service on juries, and what with other forms of pay and largesse, he made use of them against the council of Areopagus, of which he himself was no member, as having never been appointed by lot, either chief archon or lawgiver, or king or captain, for from of all these offices were conferred on persons by lot, and they who had acquitted themselves duly in the discharge of them were advanced to the court of Areopagus, and so Pericles, having secured his power in interest with the populace, directed the exertions of his party against the council with such success that most of the, these causes and matters which had been used to be tried there were by the exigency of Ephialtes removed from its cognizance. Cimon also was banished by ostracism as a favorer of the Acadamonians and a hater of the people. Though in wealth and noble birth, he was among the first, and had won several most glorious victories over the barbarians, and had filled the city with money and spoils of war, as is recorded in the history of his life, so vast an authority had Pericles obtained among the people. Now, socialism isn't just supposed to be some willy-nilly, oh, well, we want, you know, spending money or something, or we want, uh, you know, more money for, you know, the, the government workers and, you know, over the people or something, but, um, well, I mean, for some people it is, um, this, the ostracism was limited by law to ten years, but the Lacedaemonians, in the meantime, entering with a great army into the territory of Tanagra, and the Athenians going out against them, Cimon coming from his banishment before his time was out, put himself in arms and array with those of his fellow citizens that were of his own tribe and desired by his deeds to wipe off the suspicion of his favoring the Lacedaemonians by venturing his own person along with his countrymen. But Pericles' friends, gathering in a body, forced him to retire as a banished man, for which cause also Pericles seems to have exerted himself more in that than in any battle, and to have been conspicuous above all for his exposure of himself to danger. All Cumulon's friends, also to a man, fell together side by side, whom Pericles had accused with him of taking part with the Lacedaemonians, defeated in this battle on their own frontiers, and expecting a new and perilous attack with 
return of spring, the Athenians now felt regret and sorrow for the loss of Cimon, and repentance for their expulsion of him. Pericles, being sensible to the, of their feelings, did not hesitate nor delay to gratify it, and himself made the motion for recalling him home. He, upon his return, concluded a peace betwixt the two cities for the Lacedaemonians entertained as kindly feelings towards him as they did the reverse towards Pericles and other popular leaders. Yet, some there are who say that Pericles did not propose the order for Cimon's return till some private articles of agreement had been made between them, and this by means of El Pinis, Cimon's sister, that Cimon, namely, should go out to sea with a fleet of two hundred ships, and be commander-in-chief abroad, with a design to reduce the king of Persia's territories, and that Pericles should have the power at home. This Elpinique, I don't know what the Greek looks like with this, um, it was thought, had before this time procured some favor for her brother Cimon at Pericles's hands, and induced him to more remiss and gentle, uh, to be more remiss and gentle in urging the charge when Cimon was tried for his life, that Pericles was one of the committee appointed by the commons to plead against him. And when Elpnik came and besought him in her brother's behalf, he answered with a smile, "O oh, Elpnik, you are too old a woman to undertake." such business as this. And 